I say that this morning with, without my usual irony, because I can actually see you all this morning. Good to see you. You're all even better looking than I remembered. <laughs> but uh, just on a personal note, thank you for the prayers that, uh, that have been sent my way during the, I, just to let people who don't know, I had cataract surgery a couple of weeks ago and, um, and things are definitely much improved. So you'll see me switching back and forth between reading glasses and nothing this morning, but I can actually see. Well, this is, uh, this is one of the sessions I do. I, I do two types of sessions. I do um, the Doctrine, Substance of Faith session, which is, I guess you could call the primary one. And then I, I've also started another, another session where I just pick uh, selected scriptures out of my, my daily reading, going through the, the McShane plan for reading the Bible. Well, this this morning is the Doctrine, Substance of Faith. It's been a while since I've done this particular type of session. And to remind you, the goal of these, these, this particular study is to sort of go through Genesis, not verse by verse, but main topic by main topic, uh, and end up in Exodus with a study of uh, that picture of God's salvation. Now, having said that, um, we've been in Genesis chapter 1 since I started this I don't know, six months ago, maybe. Um, the fact is, there's just so much there that needs to be that needs to be talked about. And the last thing that we uh, that we discussed in Genesis chapter one was uh, man being created in the image of God and all that entails. And we're going to end that particular focus this morning. We're still going to be talking about the image of God, but we're going to move on to the fall of man in Genesis chapter 3 after that and then continue to hit major uh, topics. But we're still looking at man being created in the image of God. So let's turn to Genesis chapter 1. Uh, my introductory reading this morning, unsurprisingly, is, starts in verse 26. So Genesis 1, verse 26. This is where I do need my glasses. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every crawling thing that crawls on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Then God said, Behold, I have given you every plant-yielding seed that is on the surface of all the earth, and every tree which has fruit-yielding seed, it shall be food for you, and to every animal of the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Let me ask God's blessing on our, on our teaching this morning. Father, we thank you so much that you have drawn us to your house to worship you, in spirit and truth this morning as you have consistently and faithfully done all these many years that this church has been that has been uh, established father and it's established in your name and by grace you keep it in your name father we just ask your blessing on this teaching this morning have your holy spirit father illuminate our hearts to your truth so that we may know you better and therefore be transformed from grace to grace into the likeness of your son until he returns. And it's in his name we pray, amen. So the image of God, man being created, in fact, it's repeated twice in that passage, right? Almost for emphasis. And we've looked at all the implications of that, not all of them, but I pray most of them 
And I want to look at one more, and it has to do with the image of God as a mark of ownership on his creation, a mark of ownership. Now, what do I mean by the image indicating ownership? And I kind of wrestled with what would be a good analogy for, for that in, in something we can relate to. And really the best thing I could think of, and, and this might pique some curiosity or maybe even annoyance, but I want you to imagine how children are legally essentially the property of their parents, right? And this is a good thing. I, I, I think this could be taken perhaps the wrong way. There are certainly human beings with their own rights and their own personalities, um, their own rights given by God. But essentially, God gives them as property of their parents in a manner of stewardship. Right? You are stewards of that child to supply their needs and perhaps even some of their desires in accordance with God's will. And so when the reason that we could talk about it, even in a legal sense, and there's lots of, I, I look this up, there's lots of legal language in common law that talks about children as property. And this is for the protection of the children, but the reason, the reason that parents specifically are given this, this, this perhaps exalted title of owner, at least during their childhood, is because to those specific parents, that child bears their image. Now, it bears their image through, obviously, DNA, and it also bears their image through the training and the values, maybe even more importantly than the DNA, that are imparted to that child. So we don't say, at least in this country, we don't say that the child is the property of the state, right? We say the child is the property of the image bearer or, or the image giver of that child. That's why all kinds of legal hurdles have to be crossed in order for that child to be transferred to somebody else's stewardship. And I think that view of how God owns not just us, but the entire earth. Now, of course, it's us specifically, human beings, that are, that are made in the image of God, not the animals. We're not even told the angels are made in the image of God. This is very um, uh, anthrocentric, right? This is, uh, this, is, this is something that's spoken about mankind uniquely. And to, to get a handle on perhaps why this is such an important issue, God's ownership established through his creation and through his, his image imparting, man's image bearing. Let's go to Luke chapter 20. Luke chapter 20 is a scene out of the Passion Week. Okay? So just to set the stage, we've had the triumphal entry, and Christ has entered Jerusalem probably on that Monday. And you remember the, the thing he, he, it's indicated, the first thing he does is he goes into the temple and he cleanses it. Right? He throws out the money changers and the hucksters and the profiteers out of the temple area, out of the courtyard of the Gentiles or the women uh, was kind of where they were spread out. And he does, when, after he does so, the pronouncement he makes is, this was meant to be a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. Right? This was my father's house, but you have transferred ownership through your greed and graft and corruption. You have transferred ownership to the thieves. And he's speaking specifically there about the Sadducees who ran the, the temple complex at the time and had set up the system whereby uh, they were usuriously um, charging uh, money for sacrifices and then in some instances turning right around 
uh, with the exchange that, it, that they got from the people that were supposed to be blemished and selling them again and et cetera, et cetera. Um, outrageous prices. But he, he's, uh, his concern there that this is my God, this is God's house, this is my father's house, and you have essentially subverted, you have subverted ownership of this, and you have given it to thieves. You've given it to thieves. Now, after that incident, this, of course, enrages the Sadducees. This is how they make their money. This is the profit center. And the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the Herodians, uh, these are three distinct political groups uh, within Israel, and they're usually at each other's throat. But they find common cause in opposing Jesus Christ. And they get together and they send representatives from each of the parties in turn uh, to challenge Christ. And you'll remember that famous uh, scene where the scribes and the chief priests, in verse 19, they approach him. And it says, the scribes and the chief, chief priests tried to lay hands on him that very hour, and yet they feared the people. So they wanted to, they wanted to arrest Jesus right there at the temple, for they are aware that he had spoken this parable against them. And we'll talk about that parable in a moment. And so they watched him closely and sent spies who pretended to be righteous in order that they might catch him in some statement so that they could hand him over to the jurisdiction and authority of the governor. So they desired to, to catch him in some, in some uh, discussion that would allow them to hand him over to the governing authorities. And the spies questioned him, saying, Teacher, we know that you speak and teach correctly, and you are not partial to anyone. But you teach the way of God on the basis of truth. So this is dripping with dishonest flattery, right? Is it permissible for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Okay, so what's the issue here? They're asking... Should they, be, should they pay taxes to Caesar? Now, this isn't just a question about taxation. This is a question about how those taxes were levied and how those taxes were collected, in what form. And as we'll read, it's collected in the form of a coin called a denarius. Hey, this is what Rome expects you to pay them. And this is kind of a poll tax they're talking about. And... <clears throat> The denarius was a coin that was equal to about one day's wage. So that, that's actually pretty significant, right? That's a good amount of money. That's a lot of tax because back in those days when you lived hand to mouth and day to day, you take someone's day's wage away from them and they're not eating for a day. So this, is, this was probably an onerous tax. So let's pick it up in verse 23 says, but he, Jesus Christ, saw through their trickery. What was their trickery? Well, they're trying to, they're trying to catch Christ in a, uh, in a compromising position, all right? So think about the two options. Uh, and before we think about that, I have to state that Denarius, as we'll see, Denarius had the image of Caesar, probably at that time Tiberius. Um, it had his image on it. And on the reverse side, it had a, a, an image of him, an inscription of him sitting on a throne, and it said king and priest or something to that, to that regard. Um, so he was, he was depicted on this coin as being both king and priest, which, of course, draws to mind uh, the roles of Jesus Christ, the offices of Jesus Christ. And so what they're trying to get him to say is if he says yes, you ought to pay this tax to Rome. What he's telling them is that they ought to be keeping and distributing a coin that had the image of another god. Because remember, the Roman emperors then were considered gods. And so he would be violating um, one of the chief ten commandments, right? About not having graven images, not holding graven images, and not dealing with them in any way. So he would be in trouble with not just the religious authorities, but the people would be offended by this. Now, the people probably, probably didn't want to pay the tax, and this, this idea of that it offended God because it had an image on it was probably just a convenient excuse. But still, 
the people would have been upset. Now, if he says, no, you should not trade in these coins because I have an image on it, then he's in trouble with Rome. It's essentially an insurrection at that point. The whole reason Rome occupied territories was for taxation. They, they really didn't care about the, the control of the culture or whatnot. So he would make Rome upset. So these, these leaders are thinking, we put him in an impossible impo situation. Well, let's see how Christ deals with it. In verse 24, he says, show me a denarius. He says, all right, pull one out. Show this thing to me. Whose image and inscription does it have? They said, Caesar's. And he said to them, then pay to Caesar the things that are Caesar's. Now, a lot of times, this is where the exposition of this text focuses on and perhaps ends. This is sometimes uh, mentioned in relation to Romans chapter 13, where it talks about paying your taxes. So this is a clear instruction to the people to pay their taxes to the civil authority that God had established. Okay. But then he says something else. He says, and to God, the things that are God's. I think this is the real kicker here, because I think this is what Christ really wants to say here. I think he's saying, just like he was saying when he turned over the temple just moments before, I think what he's saying is, yeah, that belongs to Caesar. It's got, he managed to get his image on there, so that belongs to him. But your image, God's image is on you. Therefore, God owns you. You give to God you. You can give to Caesar all the money you want if it bears his image. But God owns you. The more important thing is what you do with his image, not what you do with Caesar's image. Now, this is reinforced, I believe, by the previous chapters. Now, this story, this, this account, is in all the synoptic gospels. Okay? It's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I think the most full one is in Luke, but it's important enough to be in all three of them. right? And in all three of them, it's preceded by what I'll call ownership parables. So the, the whole, a lot of the discourse before this even happens is Christ talking about God's ownership. If you look at, uh, and you don't have to turn here, but in Luke chapter 19 is the famous uh, uh, parable, the familiar parable, uh, where he talks about um, a nobleman went into a distant country to receive a kingdom for himself and then to return. So what does he do? He, he hands out these these, what are called minas. Again, we're talking about coinage here. And he gives them to three of his servants. So he's giving property, things that he owns, to his servants. And he's going to test the servants on how they uh, stored this property, whether they're able to return it on investment. So this is a parable about, about what God owns and what we do with it. And If we look back uh, in Mark, uh, in Mark chapter 12, again, you don't have to turn there, but this is, uh, this is an account right before the account of the, uh, the render unto Caesars in Mark. It says, he began to speak to them in parables. A man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a vat under the wine press and built a tower. And you remember this parable. This is the parable where he goes on a trip, much like the other one, and he owns this vineyard and he's put stores in charge of it, and he sends servants back to collect um, the, the profits from the vineyard, and, you know, they beat one servant, and, and they kill another, and then finally he sends his son, and, or, or actually, they don't kill another, but they beat and abuse the servants, and he sends his son, and then they kill the son, okay? So that also is about God's ownership, God's ownership of the vineyard, the vineyard in this case being, being Israel, so God owns Israel. And then we also remember the parable about the, the man who planted the, the fig tree, another, another symbol of Israel, and the man planted a fig tree, and, and he sees that it has no fruit, so he says, cut it down. But 
the steward says, no, give it another year again. Just talking about God's ownership of this tree and someone intervening to save the tree because God owns it and he doesn't want it taking up ground and not producing any fruit. So these parables that precede this are all about God's ownership. Now, there's other parables that don't necessarily fit that model, but, but a lot of it does. A lot of it is talking about God's ownership, specifically of Israel. Um, but we can extend that, in fact, over all the earth. And, and let's look at that. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention a lot of scriptures here, so I'll, I'll give you the reference. Don't, you don't need, need to feel compelled to, to turn there because I'm going to try to go through this a little quickly. But uh, Psalm 24.1. And these are going to be all about God's, what is God's? What is God's in creation? Well, Psalm 24, 1 tells us the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness. So everything on the earth, the earth itself and everything it contains, excuse me. Then it says the world and all those who dwell therein. So this is talking about mankind, the world, and everyone who dwells in it. So the physical earth, the, image, the, uh, the inanimate uh, elements of the earth, everything that's in them, and, every, and everybody that dwells on the earth. They belong to God. They're his. Why? Because he created them. Haggai, chapter 2, verse 8, says, The silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. So God owns everything that's in the earth. Psalm 50, verses 10 through 12, says, For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know all the birds of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine, and all its fullness. God's saying, I don't, if, if I could be hungry, and of course God doesn't get hungry in the way we do for for nourishment, but if he did, he wouldn't have to go to anybody else to get his nourishment because he owns everything. Genesis 14, 19 says, and he blessed him and said, blessed be Abraham of God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. Same concept. Job 41, 11, God speaking to Job asking him this question, who has preceded me that I should pay him? Everything under heaven is mine. Exodus 19.5. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. Deuteronomy 10.14 says, Indeed, heaven and the highest heavens, we've been talking about earth and people and cattle and beasts and whatnot. Now it says, Indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord your God, also the earth with all that is in it. So the heavens belong to God. And I think the highest heavens is talking about the, 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 the spectral realm, um, uh, you know, the stars and the universe and that sort of thing, and, and perhaps even heaven itself, the, the abode of God. That all belongs to him. Colossians 1 says, He is the image of the invisible God, speaking of Christ, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth. This is, again, speaking of Christ. We know that Christ was the creator of heavens and earth. We know that from various places, most notably John chapter 1. Visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Okay? All things were created through him and for him, meaning they belonged to him. They were create he created them so that he could own them. And this includes not just heaven and earth, but it's saying all things, visible or even invisible whether they're thrones, talking about powers and kingdoms or dominions or rulers themselves or authorities. God, Jesus Christ owns them all. They were created for him to own. God owns it all. What is God's response to his ownership of creation, including mankind, and especially mankind in this case? 
how does he regard it? How does he feel about his ownership? Is he is he um, kind of flippant about it? Yeah, I created this and I own it, but the thrill's gone after I created it, and I really don't care about it anymore. That was fun. Now go off, do your thing. Or does he guard it jealously? Exodus chapter 20, verse 4. One of the commandments, you shall not make for, your, for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on earth beneath. This goes back to the situation in Luke chapter 22 about why they thought the, the image on the coinage would be offensive. Or in the water under you, you shall not worship them nor serve them, for I, the Lord God, am a jealous God inflicting the punishment of the fathers on the children on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. Is God cavalier about his ownership of mankind? He's jealous. He's jealous to the point of wrath. Wrath that would extend generations to those who hate him. Exodus chapter 34, verse 14. For you shall worship no other the God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. God's not just jealous. He's so jealous for his ownership, for his property, that he takes the name Jealous itself. I want you to understand, I want you to see where it talks about God being a jealous God. What is the, if I can use the term, emotion that follows this jealousy in all these passages? Deuteronomy 4.24, For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Kind of speaks for itself. Deuteronomy 6.15, For the Lord your God is in your midst, for the Lord your God in your midst is a jealous God. And it says, lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you, and he destroy you from off the face of the earth. It seems like jealousy always leads to anger, right? Always leads to wrath. Deuteronomy 32, 16. They stirred him, speaking of the nation of Israel, they stirred him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations. They provoked him to anger. Joshua 24, verse 19. But Joshua said to the people, You are not able to serve the Lord, for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. Whoa will not forgive your transgressions or your sins. Not in his anger, not in his jealousy. We'll see that he does in other attributes. Nahum 1-2 says, The Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. Jealousy, anger, leads to anger and wrath on the part of God. Zechariah 8, 2, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Zion with great jealousy. This is Zion, obviously a reference to the nation of Israel. And I am jealous for her with great wrath. Job 41, Who has been first to give me that I should repay him? Who, and I'm sorry, that's a misplaced reference there. So I'll skip that one. 2 Corinthians 20, verse 11. Now we're jumping to the New Testament. And Paul here is going to mirror God's righteous jealousy. He's writing to the Corinthians who, as we know, were a wayward congregation that he had established. They had all kinds of problems. Uh, He had to write to them multiple times, even a letter called the severe letter, So I think it's safe to say that Paul got angry with the Corinthian church. 
in chapter 20, verse 11, he says, I wish that you would bear with me in a little foolishness, but indeed you are bearing with me. Why? It says, for I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. Why is he jealous for them? Why does he, why does he have this same jealousy that God has for his people on, on God's behalf? It says, for I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. I married you to Christ. You are his property. It says to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. You don't belong to yourself as a Christian. You have been betrothed to Christ. He is your owner. So what ought be our response to God's ownership? 1 Corinthians 6, and we can turn here. Same church, Paul writing to the same church, the Corinthian church. He talked to them in that previous passage about how they were owned by Christ. And he does so throughout, throughout this epistle. But in 1 Corinthians 6, beginning in verse 12, he's talking about how we are to regard our rights in, re in regard to our ownership, our, our being owned by Christ. Verse 12 says, All things are permitted for me, but not all things are of benefit. And he's talking about the freedom we have in Christ here. All things are permitted for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food is for the stomach, and the stomach is for food. However, God will do away with both of them. But the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord is for the body. Now, God has not only raised the Lord, but will also raise us up through his power. Do you know that your bodies are parts of Christ? Shall I then take away the parts of Christ and make them parts of a prostitute? So he's talking here specifically about sexual immorality, but really any kind of immorality. And he's saying, you know, you belong to something. Why would you give yourself away to sin? It says, far from it. This is uh, verse 16 now. Or do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says the two shall become one flesh. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every other sin that a person commits is outside the body. But the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Again, he's talking specifically about sexual sin here. And again, he, uh, a reminder, he's living in uh, a society where one of the prevailing um, dogmas, philosophies, is that it doesn't really matter what you do with your body because the body is, all physical things are essentially evil. There's nothing you can do about that. The spirit is good. The body is evil. There's nothing you can do about it, so you might as well just let the sins that you do with your body kind of like run amok, right? This is what he's dealing with there. He's trying to oppose that philosophy. And how he does it is you... A lot of times as Christians, we, we do think about, if we do think in terms of our, our being owned by God, it's, it's our spirit, right? We think in terms of our spirit. But do you know that your body, every part of your body is owned by God? Why? Because it is the temple that belongs to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit owns your body. It's his temple. And it goes on to say, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own. You don't belong to yourself. Okay? You don't own yourself. Verse 20 says, for you have been bought, bought for a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. If somebody buys you, 
and I'm not, <laughs> got to be careful here because I'm not suggesting that uh, on a human scale, the purchase of human beings is in any way moral or godly. But if God buys you, and he did, if you're a Christian in Jesus Christ, then you've been bought for a price, a high price. Therefore, you belong to him. He owns your body. It says, therefore, glorify God in your body. God doesn't just own the universe. He just doesn't own mankind. But he owns Christians. And he owns them in a way that's different from his other types of ownership. We are twice his. First by creation and second through redemption. God has a double title on us as Christians. 1 Corinthians 3 says, And I, brothers and sisters, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but only as fleshly, as to infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not able to consume it. But even now you are not able, for you are still fleshly, since there is jealousy and strife from, uh, among you. Are you not fleshly, and are you not walking like ordinary people? For one per person says, I am with Paul, and another, I am with Apollos, and are not ordinary people. So what's going on here? One of the things that Paul's dealing with is these Christians in the Corinthian church going around in factions saying, you know, I'm a devotee of Apollos, who was another, another preacher. I'm a devotee of Paul. I'm a devo devotee of, you know, who knows, Timothy. And on and on and on. Okay? So let's go down to verse 16. How does Paul address this? Again, he repeats what he had said before. Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? If anyone destroys the temple of God, God will destroy that person, for the temple of God is holy, and that is what you are. He's, he, he's addressing what he had just stated at the beginning of the chapter. He's saying, no, you are not a devotee. You are not given to Apollos or Paul or anyone else. You belong to God. You are God's possession. And in the intervening verses, he, Paul talks about how Apollos and himself, they're, they're just builders of this building, of this temple. But God is the owner. They're just contractors working on it. Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 1, says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Now, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but again, your bodies are so owned by God that we're to give them over as sacrifices to him. We don't own them. They're God's. Much like God demanded the Israelites hand over the firstborn, really, of all their of all their creatures, their children, and the, their livestock as well. That's how you're supposed to give yourself over. You're a sacrifice. Deuteronomy 10, verse 12 says, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and love him, and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the Lord's commandments and his statutes, which I, I am commanding you today for, for your good. Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the highest heavens, the earth and all that is in it. This is interesting. He's saying, Moses is saying here, or actually this is God speaking. It says, he's saying, what you owe me, what you owe me is fear. You owe me to walk in my ways. You owe me love, service. And not just all those things, but all those things with all your heart and all your soul. And to keep his commandments and statutes. Why? Because I own everything. That's his reason in verse 14. Because I own everything. We don't owe that to God because God redeemed us. 
and I'll, I'll expand on that uh, hopefully in a little bit. But everyone owes that to God, and everything owes that to God because God owns it all. He created it all, and he owns it all. Exodus chapter 19 says, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. So he's saying there, he's saying, you're going to be, if you keep my commandments, you're going to be a special possession of mine. But don't, don't think that not, every, don't think that everything is not mine, because it is. Just because I'm saying you're a special possession, I possess everything. Now, the irony is, well, I suppose it's not an irony, but the truth is we, we are all owned by God, but we are all also owned by something else. Romans chapter 6 said, talks about us that we were slaves of sin. We were slaves of sin. And now, if you're a Christian, you're a slave of God. So essentially, if you're outside of Jesus Christ, it's not as if you've broken free of your ownership from God. What you've done, you're essentially a runaway slave. Okay? And you run right in to the slavery of sin. So you are owned by something regardless of whether or not you accept God's ownership. In John 8, 34, Jesus tells the Pharisees, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is the slave to sin. So what God does through Jesus Christ is he reclaims you from your runaway status. He returns you to your natural, ordained, master. That's why the term Christian essentially means slave to Christ. What does Paul call himself throughout the New Testament? Bond servant. He calls himself a slave to Christ. But the thing is, we are not slaves like we are slaves to sin. We are not captured for bondage. We are captured for freedom. God does not enslave us. God redeems us in our love and gratitude for that love and that act of mercy and grace is to throw ourselves into slavery to Jesus Christ. We are not enslaved by God. We react to that redeeming act as if we're slaves to God. We're not in bondage. All right, very quickly, uh, and I'm going to probably just paraphrase this. In Revelation chapter 5, there's a scene in heaven. John's a witness to it, and there's crying and wailing because the king, God, is sitting on the throne. He's got the title deed to the universe, the ownership deed of the universe in his hands. And They're looking for somebody who is worthy to open this, right? They're looking for a man to be able to open this title deed. And the cry in heaven is, oh, no, no one is worthy to open this. And John cries. Why does John cry at this? Because he so longs to see the vindication of God and the saints and the earth, to have the earth be rid of sin and oppression and murder and violence that he cries that no one's able to open up this title deed and take ownership of the earth away from Satan. But lo and behold, he's comforted by one of the elders and he says, the Lamb of God, he who was slain, is worthy to open the title deed. At the end time, God will crush the usurper who is attempting to claim ownership of this world, and he'll open up the title deed. He'll well, he'll give it to Christ. Christ will open up the title deed and pour judgment out on this earth, this planet of runaway 
servants. It's a planet of runaway slaves who have run into the slavery of sin. But if you're in Jesus Christ, he's opening that title deed on your behalf because he will share that kingdom that he will come to possess with you and you'll be there forever with him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we are owned, not by ourselves, but by you. Because ownership of ourselves is death. We will direct ourselves and guide ourselves straight into the grave and straight into hell. But you, Father, have taken hold of us. You have reclaimed your deed in our lives through Jesus Christ. And in him is salvation, Father. We don't want to own ourselves. We want to throw ourselves, our body, our soul, our mind, into your possession, Father, because we love you. It's in these things we pray. Amen.